I don't know that I have a whole lot to say. Okay, um, but this is Deborah Herzog. <laughs> she is an uh, um, occupational therapist who has spoken at the ADHDKC meeting previously, and she was scheduled to talk earlier in the summer. And then with COVID, we kind of put it off, hoping that we could meet again in person, but that didn't work. So she's here today to talk about something I actually do not know much about, but primitive reflexes and ADHD. Okay, awesome. So, okay, so with primitive reflexes and ADHD, um, let me just kind of scroll through the next screen here. Okay, this a little bit about me here. Um, so I'm an occupational therapist, like Kristen said, and um, I uh, am the founder and CEO of St. Nicholas Children's Therapies. And so uh, for occupational therapy services. Um, and let's see here. Okay, so looking at primitive reflexes. We're talking about, can we rewire the brain? There's lots of um, literature out there on brain plasticity, Plastic plasticity meaning um, able to change the brain. And there is lots of information out there. And then also looking at um, why some of our kids aren't, why some kids aren't doing like developing the way they should be. And what type of missing links are we looking for? Like what, what was missing during their development? What didn't happen? And how does that affect the child later in life? Especially once they get into grades where they're, um, where it really starts coming out, such as, especially second grade, we see a lot more second grade and it just continues to come out after that. If certain developmental um, steps are not addressed, are, met all right so okay so we're just looking at missing links as far as child development okay so and we're looking at primitive reflexes and the part that that plays in um how we can change the brain all right so primitive reflexes um just looking back um when a baby's born, uh, they have primitive reflexes that they normally have to go through. And um, they actually start while the child is in, baby is in uterus. Some of them start to, um, to like, like the child is utilizing these primitive reflexes without actively controlling them. And so, these, let's see here, let me see my next slide here. I wanna, I don't wanna get too far ahead of myself here. All right, so here, like I, I, I did have it in here. So they start to form while the baby's in the womb and they help the baby navigate the birthing process, um, breastfeeding, bottle feeding, um, let's see, gripping onto like your pinky. Like when you, uh, a baby is there and you put your, um, you put your like, um, you put your finger out and the baby just wraps, uh, wraps their hand around your, around your finger. So they're not doing it intentionally in, initially. It's just a primitive reflex. It's called a Palmer reflex, okay? And the baby has to naturally go through certain reflexes. And then um, eventually these reflexes will integrate. We call them like integrate or they, they don't, they kind of like go away, um, but they, but the baby has to go through these primitive reflexes before they can move on to the next level, okay? So what we're seeing is, is that um, for whatever reason, like when a baby doesn't go through these reflexes the way they should, that afterwards, the reflexes that are there permanently for the rest of your life are affected as well such as like your balance and equilibrium are just one set of reflexes that are there later on. So these primitive reflexes, they take up to about 12 months to integrate and they're, they're vital. So um, let me see here. Okay, so they go away or they integrate as a child goes through various stages of development. Um, and then the more mature reflexes appear that the child uses voluntarily body control um, for the rest of their life. 
like for example, the like I said, the body control reflexes to keep their balance and equilibrium, and reflexes that help a child's coordination. All right, and so when they must go through the stages of each primitive reflex, um, so your child um, may have or or they may have challenges ahead. So here's kind of what happens if the primitive reflexes don't quote, integrate, or they don't integrate fully. All right, um, let's see here. And I'm gonna go ahead and go through this quickly here. Um, so they don't integrate or they don't integrate fully. Um, basically, we're looking at missing links of important sequential development that doesn't happen, or they show up as learning disabilities in reading, math, writing, and organization, and organizing um, thoughts for writing or they show up as um, with ADHD as well too, and they show up as undesired behaviors, which cause frustration, um, like, or, they, or like motor incoordination. And then they also show up as difficulties in sensory processing, um, struggles in self-regulation, life functions, okay? Because all of those areas are controlled more so not just by like our like just different areas of the brain and so they're also controlled by our our, um, our higher brain centers as well too and the primitive reflexes are more not so controlled by the higher brain centers but once those like those first reflexes the primitive ones integrate that gives us a, a person more control to use their higher brain centers which is what we see is expected as a child gets older. And the children who have a hard time with that, then that just means that those primitive reflexes didn't quite integrate. Okay, so let's see here. What if they're still present? Um, if they're still present, that means they haven't quite integrated them, then, um, the child's unable to fully access their higher brain centers for like reading, memorizing spelling words, math facts, remembering where the keys are on the computer, um, remembering their manners for self-control before reacting, thinking in flexible ways, um, or processing the directions to complete their schoolwork, or, if, or even a simple recipe or using adequate motor control for using a crayon or scissors. And then I wanna just kinda of go back a little bit too. So when your baby's born, they do go through, like the doctors and nurses, they go, the nurses, they go through and they test some of these primitive reflexes um, initially. And, um, and so, like when they're doing their testing, they're actually testing some of the primitive reflexes to see if they're present. And then, cause they should, most of them should, they should see some of them present at birth. All right, so, but typically after that, nobody really looks at those um, as from my understanding. And, and so they kind of get missed. All right, so, so anyway, we're looking at, this is just another avenue on looking at a child's development to help their development is to see, um, like if I if I see a child um, just navigating through their space and like if I observe them with what they're doing, I can tell right off that certain reflexes are not integrated. I can see us are having challenges and I can see it pretty clearly just during their functioning. Um, then I can also go back and test some of them, most of, or, some of them through just um, a testing process. And I can see them also that way as well too. Um, and then I can also look at them through um, a parent questionnaire. And because parents can provide a lot of information since you um, see them all the time. And, and that's what I want to show you is like a, basically it's, I'm going to go through a checklist. And so I'm not going to be able to hit on every single part of them just because it's pretty long, but we can go over some of them tonight. 
Okay, and this is just saying that basically an occupational therapist has who has expertise in primitive reflexes and understands them, then that's how you can use that to help integrate your child's primitive reflexes. So, and, and what I usually do is use it um, a lot through like um, playing and so like a child doesn't even know that they're doing these, they're going through certain movements that actually help to integrate those reflexes so that they can then move on to the next level of where they need to be at, where things become easier. Okay, so here. These are just things I look at as far as, first I look at their muscle tone and see like the girl down here in the corner um, let's see here. Right, let me see if I can get on my, uh, there we go. A little spotlight here. Okay. So here, this is a child that's W sitting and the child's W sitting because they don't have the, the core trunk stability to sit crisscross applesauce. And so if the W sitting actually widens their base of support, to help them sit up longer. They're having to compensate because, because they don't have the, the muscle control. And the primitive reflexes, when a child goes through a typical development, will they build that core muscle control and throughout their body so they can sit crisscross applesauce or the legs in front of them without having to sit in a W sit. All right. And Let's see, and I'm not gonna go through every single one of these, but um, I'm gonna kind of hit on some highlight certain ones. All right, so let's see here. So here's a reflex called fear paralysis reflex. And I'm not gonna go into detail exactly what they look like because it gets a little confusing, but here's, here's, some, here's what you observe in your child when some of these are not quite integrated. All right, so they might hear sounds that others do not. Like I've heard kids say, um, like if they hear the, the, um, the clock ticking or they hear lights and when someone else, they want, they completely tune that out and they don't even hear that because they hear the other information they're supposed to be focusing on. Okay. Um, let's see here. They're visually distracted. Okay. Um, Oh, back here, they startle easily to noises or like the child who, who sees a, like a bee and they really react and they're just pan, almost in a panic mode when they see a bee, very much fearful of it. And, and of course, it's going to be normal for kids to be a little, to be fearful of a bee, but it depends on how they react to it as well, too. Um, let's see here. They don't like their eyes covered up or maybe they don't like getting water in their eyes, or here they easily startle, uh, they easily startles or uh, fearful to touch stimuli, all right? They may gag easily. And here's some more on this list here too. Okay, so they, they might hold their body stiffly, or they have difficulty with ball skills, um, they're going to be more hyperactive when that fear paralysis reflex is not integrated. Okay, so you're going to see things like um, excessive anxiety or negativity. Um, that's going to lead more to like depression, isolation, being withdrawn, like more keeping to yourself, constantly feeling overwhelmed, like with homework and transitions. Then you're going to see extreme shyness fear of groups or excessive fear of embarrassment that typically other people would not even be bothered by. They would kind of say, okay, well, this happened and, you know, they can process that, you know, it was a little embarrassing, but I can get past it versus somebody who, whose fear paralysis reflex is not fully integrated or not integrated at all. They're going to have that excessive fear of embarrassment and, they're just gonna hold it with them for a long time. And then you're gonna get that lack of trust. And then also 
where you get that feeling of being stuck or that deer in the headlights look. And, you know, so when you're trying to, your, your child's just kind of spacing off and you're like, okay, they're not really listening to me right now. They're not, I'm not sure what, what they're thinking. Maybe they're not thinking at anything at all. They're just kind of stuck. All right, that, that's what happens with the fear paralysis reflex and it's not integrated. Okay, then you're gonna see some sleep and eating difficulties. Okay, you're gonna see temper tantrums, obsessive control, um, compulsive behaviors, um, intense emotional reactions. They can quickly go from calm to intense when this, when this one's not uh, integrated. So here's another one, this is a rooting reflex. And a rooting reflex is is what um, is what's necessary when um, when a child when a baby eats. All right. So I've seen older kids. So basically, if I were to take my my finger here, you know, a baby would do this. They would turn toward that. Um, I've seen older kids. If you do this to them, they'll turn toward they'll turn towards your finger, okay? That is a reflex that's used for when a baby is going to like um, like nurse or like bottle feed so they can turn toward their food, okay? But they don't need it, they don't need it past a certain age. So I've seen older kids that still have that reflex and they'll still do this, they'll still turn toward your finger if you do that with their on their face, okay? And that will tell you that's not, it's not integrated yet. Okay, and you'll see um, things like that from that not being integrated yet. You're going to see, you can see speech and articulation problems, thumb sucking, difficulty with food textures, or just being a picky eater, um, hypersensitive around the mouth area. You might see overeating from it not being fully uh, integrated. Okay, so then here's a moral reflex. And this one's this one um basically from the this one's really closely related to the fear paralysis reflex so you're going to see um if the fear paralysis reflex does not integrate the moro reflex is for sure not going to integrate and the child's not going to get to go through that reflex um the way they should be during child development okay so when the child's <clears throat> having that fear, they're gonna seek more sedentary play, they're gonna be withdrawn, they'll have difficulty making friends, it creates them to be more easily distracted because they're just not in that calm mode, okay? They're gonna be easily sensitive to light and sound and movement and touch and, um, and smell. Um, it could um, increase like motion sickness, um, the child may avoid movement or vestibular task, or you can see impulsive, aggressive, um, or overreacting to small situations. So you might basically see like the child yell and kick and tantrums and shutdowns. And, and when I see this, I see this that it's more than the, than like the normal range. Okay, because you're going to see this in a younger child but you probably shouldn't see this as the child gets older because as the child gets older, they're going to be able to, typically they would be um, in more of a calm state so they can access their higher um, thinking centers to where they can say, oh, they can process that situation and, and then they can process how they should respond to it without overreacting. Or they can process, you know, their feelings better, how something makes them feel, and they can process and say, "Oh, let's see, I need help with some. I'm having difficulty with something," and they can process, "I need to ask for help," and then they can process, "Oh, I'm going to ask for help," and they know how to ask for help with, you know, with more of a calm voice. But when these reflexes are not integrated, that it basically prevents the child from accessing those higher lobes of thinking so they can process and know what to do in different situations. Okay, so this is where you can teach a child, you know, repeatedly, and then they're still not 
they're still having difficulty from day to day. And again, that's where you have, we can go back as an occupational therapist and basically help integrate those developmental levels or developmental areas with primitive reflexes. So the child can then, you know, we can integrate those better so the child then can uh, access higher thinking centers and to be more calm and then to listen and take in the information they need to take in and respond how they should respond. Okay. Um, okay, so other things we'd see is avoidance behaviors, being easily uh, triggered, uh, reacts in anger or emotional outbursts, or becoming um, anxious easily, or you might see them acting younger than their actual age. And then um, they can also affect their, um, their balance and coordination. Or you might see them constantly seeking movement. So, you know, a lot of this looks like you're seeing some sensory um, processing issues going on. Or, and, and so, and that does, when the primitive reflexes are not integrated, or the child doesn't go through these reflexes in a in close to a typical range, then, then it will also affect their sensory system very much so. All right. <clears throat> Let's see. Um, these are just some other areas like the child may be a thrill seeker um, with that regard to safety. Um, they might have cycles of hyperactivity or then extreme fatigue, then poor stamina. You might also see shallow breathing patterns or tend, they tend to hold their breath because they're kind of stuck in a, they're kind of stuck with that, like the deer in the headlights look. So, um, and also it, this affects their coordination. So that's going to affect your breathing patterns um, with, during your speaking or just even if you're not speaking because the breathing is a coordination as well too. Okay, so let's see here. Oh, you might see things like difficulty falling asleep um, or staying asleep, waking up or waking up tired. Let's see here. Or fearful or resistant to learning new information. Avoids um, um, learning new information at school. And you're going to see that because um, they're kind of in that stuck mode. They're kind of stuck. And... And it's also if, if they didn't go through this reflex normally as a younger child for whatever reason, um, then they're going to have a hard, harder time accessing their higher brain centers. So therefore, you're going to see that resistance. And because they're going to be fearful, um, because if you can't access your higher brain centers for learning, then it's, it's, it's scary. It's scary. That information, like it goes in as information goes into like their higher brain center, like part of it goes in, but the other part of it doesn't go in. So if you're trying to learn new information and your brain's only taking in part of the information, then it's pretty scary because it's you just it's hard to know what to do with that information when only part of the information is given. Or when only part of the information feels like it's given, only part of the information actually enters into where it needs to go into the brain so the brain can decipher what it needs to do so it knows how to react and respond. Okay. Um, you might see things like the child, is a, they, when they were younger, they didn't like their head being tipped back during hair washing, just adapting to changes, um, difficulty making choices. So if they only have part of the information um, being accessed. If they only hear part, if they only hear part of the information, then they're going to have a harder time making a choice. Not having all the information enter where it needs to go into for their higher learning centers. Okay, then you can see also food sensitivities, food allergies, or just a weakened immune system too. Then you might see some vision and reading and writing difficulties as well, too. Just lots of frustration. Okay, so um, this one here is a, a 
let's see, um, the cross extension here. So they early walkers. So I hear parents say, oh gosh, my child walked really early. I'm like, that's awesome. You know, the parents thinking that's awesome. Like, hey, they walked at nine months of age. Well, that's not always a, the, a good thing. So typically when children walk early, that means that they miss going through some of the other primitive reflexes or they didn't they didn't uh, stay in that primitive reflex developmental stage very long. Um, and so um, when they miss it and they skip part of that and they jump to the next level, which typically you see that with kids who walk early, then that is going to affect um, their learning and their um, like everything going forward. All right, so with these kids, you see, um, with this reflex, you see difficulty riding a bicycle, like without the training wheels. Um, they may be more hesitant to go up and down stairs. You're going to see more um, poor posture, like slumping, like with this child here. You see more of this C curve in the back here. Okay, and then you're also going to see hyperactivity as well. Okay, and on my screen, I'm actually, I can't see the bottom of my screen very well. So if someone has a question in there, I can't, um, I can't see it. Um, so I'm not sure if anyone has any questions or not so far. Okay, so the next one is, a, it's, a, it's called a spinal gallant reflex. And you're gonna see like um, hyperactivity, being restless, especially if like clothes or, um, or a tag brushes up against them. You're going to see a lot of um, fidgety and wiggly, like kind of like ants in your pants. That's going to be, you're going to see poor concentration, poor attention, difficulty with short term memory. Okay, especially when sitting in a chair and you're kind of thinking, oh gosh, what, what does that mean if they're sitting in a chair? Well, um, part of these reflexes, um, it, they help to um, your upper body and lower body work separately from each other and so if you're if a child is sitting in their chair it's hard for them to keep their knees bent like your um, your hips are bent or they're, they're flexed and your knees are bent and your elbows are bent and it affects their learning it affects them it makes it difficult for them to keep all those joints bent at one time all right so if a child is standing, that actually helps them to, um, like, especially if this reflex is not integrated, they'll actually learn better. So um, you might want to try this with the, your kiddos. Um, if they stand, so their legs are straight and like their arms then can be bent while they're learning, they're actually going to be able to um, be able to attend a little bit better. Okay, so let's see here. Okay, so here um, also this also affects bedwetting long after the child has been toilet trained. Okay, or long after when they should have been toilet trained. And then you, a child might have difficulty um, with control of their, um, their bowel um, or, or bladder. Okay, they, they don't make it to the bathroom in time. Okay, so a lot of that is, is, um, so all of these reflexes that a child needs to go through normally during development, again, if they don't go through those the way they need to go through or for the length of time they should be in, in them. And um, then all of those, our muscle can, our um, ability to control certain muscles are affected. Okay, even like, like, like I said, the bowel and bladder muscles as well too. All right, so let's see, they tend to adjust their body um, or you might, these are the kids you see falling out of their chair more. So at school, they're falling out of their chair all day and they look like they're just kind of really wiggly and the ants in their pants. And so, and they're just have a lot of um, movement going on. So yes, this does, you can look at this as a sensory um, area where they need to fall and do crashing and falling to feel where their body is in space. But it's also because when these reflexes 
don't like when a child doesn't um, go through these reflexes the way they should, then um, it affects how their sensory system works later on. Okay, let's see. Um, and again, I had mentioned before, you see posture problems, like a lot of slumping. They have a hard time sitting up. Like you could say, okay, sit tall, and they just have a hard time sitting up. And usually they have lower muscle tone as well, okay? And then when they have a lower muscle tone and they, you see a lot of like slumping, those are the kids that usually have a harder time writing. Um, and so because if they don't have that core muscle strength in their body, it's hard to be able to control what the hand does. And then their hands and their arms fatigue and their bodies fatigue very quickly. And then it's just not fun. It's just frustrating for the child. Okay. So let's see here. Okay. So a lot of poor, uh, they get, their gross motor coordination is affected. You'll see them having more low endurance. They tire out easily and fatigue easily. Okay. So here, this is just one. You might see them leaning on other people or objects to help them with their balance and their stability. Or um, like you might see like the like their low back is kind of stuck in an arch position where their bottom stick out more. They have a, a big curve in their back. Or I said with the other one, the other reflexes earlier, you might see also they're more of a slumping posture. All right. So. Oh, and this one here, you might see a delay in crawling or a delay in walking like after 16 months of age. All right, let's see here. Okay, so with this one here, you might see the child um, leaning forward um, in standing or while sitting at the table. So leaning forward, they might be a child who likes to lay their head on the table a lot. Okay, and then they also, this affects being more of a picky eater too. So kids who are picky eaters, so they may call it a sensory issue or a behavior issue, but if we go back further, it's most likely from a developmental issue, developmentally where the child didn't go through certain stages the way they should have. And these certain stages are where these primitive reflexes, where their child is utilizing them and then eventually integrates them where you don't to go on to the next step. And these all build upon each other. All right, or you might see the child, they, they, pray, they play roughly with um, people or objects, okay? Or they can have short and long-term memory issues. All right, so here, this one's called an asymmetrical tonic neck reflex. And um, I wouldn't really worry too much about the names. Just kind of look at the checklist of you can see areas that like your child might be having difficulty with and just knowing that like the big picture is is that your child you know may have not gone through the certain developmental stages the way they should have or be um, go through them for as long as like uh, they have to go through certain developmental stages for at least a certain period of time before they move to the next one okay and during that process, this is where all these primitive reflexes are um, um, being integrated. All right, so here's our things you're gonna see where they have difficulty catching a ball, so the eye-hand coordination, difficulty in sports. So they might say, okay, I don't like this certain sport, or I don't, they don't like sports. And it's because it's not that they don't like it, or they're bored, or they might say they're bored with it. They're just, they don't like to be, um, you know, they want to feel success. And if a child has a hard time with um, like catching a ball with their eye hand coordination and they don't feel successful, then they're not going to want to do it. It's just too challenging for them, okay? Um, all right, so they might, this also affects their balance. And then, or you might also see tension or 
problems in the shoulders and the neck and the back and the hips. Or also, um, I see a lot of children who have a lot of difficulty with crossing the midline. Okay, so they have to go through these certain developmental steps and that helps them to be able to cross the midline. So the midline is break down your, break down your, um, the middle of your body and they to be able to reach their hand over. So what they might see is a child who, um, who uses both hands dominantly or they have, I don't, let me back up. They don't quite, they'll use one hand to start with and then they switch to their other hand. Well, part of that is that um, the hand might fatigue. Remember all that fatigue I was talking about, their muscles are gonna fatigue. But um, let's say they, have, they need to reach over and grab something. Well, instead of them reaching over and grab it, they can't cross the midline and they just use your other hand to pick it up with. So they just, they're compensating because they can't cross the midline. And um, so the brain has to be able to, you know, both sides have to be able to work together for, for these higher learning, um, higher learning to happen or just like ball skills, balance. And when these um, reflexes, when a child doesn't go through these reflexes in more of a normal pattern, then that affects their development. Alrighty, so let's see here. All right, so here you might see some, okay, here's where you come in the easy, but they become easily distracted, difficulty in school, math and reading issues. Um, they might skip parts of the line or words when they're reading. So then things aren't going to make sense. Okay, so when they when someone has to ask them a question, they don't really know the answer because if they miss part of the word or skip lines, what they read is not going to make sense for what the questions are asking. All right, um, then you also may see difficulty copying from the board. Okay, um, let's see here. They don't like working puzzles. They'll have letter and number reversals. And it looks like their preferred hand is not quite determined. Again, that might be because they can't cross midline and they're trying to compensate by using the other hand. Okay, or it could just be um, one hand gets fatigued easily, so they compensated to use the other hand. Okay, so and, and if that's the case, it's going to result in like immature or messy handwriting or poor pencil grip. So then, two, you're going to see like a disorganized approach with tasks, like even just like getting dressed, brushing um, teeth. Um, toileting, um, preparing simple foods, the schoolwork, or you might see slowed responses to auditory information. So that when you tell your child something and they don't respond right away, okay, and then you have to get really close to them and really get their attention, and then you have to just give them a little bit of information at a time, okay, so because they're having a hard time processing the information that through their ears, like that sensory information that comes in. And I say sensory, but that's because when these reflexes don't integrate, then it affects the whole area of development going forward. All right. Or they don't respond to their name. Difficulty following directions because they're not being able to take everything in and, and then integrate it in your higher brain centers. Because again, if you're going to follow directions from someone and only bits and pieces of the information get in, then you're not going to know what to do. You're not, a child's not going to know how to respond. Okay. Or they might frequently ask, ask questions to be repeated, like say, say what a lot. Then you're going to see misunderstanding frequently. Okay. So here's this palmar reflex I'm talking about with the hand, okay? So when a baby has, uh, when they start to go through their palmar reflex, this is the one that's really easy for people to see and you, and you, um, the baby has their hand there and you just put your finger there and the baby grasp around the hand, your fingers. Or 
um, and then uh, but and then they they don't have voluntarily control of that but later on you could do that when the reflex is integrated and the baby's not going to put their hand or they're not going to wrap their hand around your finger okay i've seen older kids that if i just were to like barely touch right here they basically still will grasp around my hand all right so that tells me that that reflex is not integrated usually i see that with kids who have a hard time holding the pencil they have a hard time with writing um and then two i see that with kids who did not like they didn't crawl very much or they didn't be on, be on their belly very much because when a baby is on their belly and they're using their hands on the floor that's helping to integrate that reflex or when they're crawling that helps to integrate that reflex because they feel all those different textures on their hands when they're crawling whether it be like on carpet um, different types of flooring or being out in the grass crawling that's into, that's helping um, to develop um, these different reflexes. So then, if, if it's not developed or if it's not integrated properly, then you're going to see um, poor handwriting, messy handwriting, um, light pressure with handwriting, or you might see excessive pressure with handwriting. Um, the child will say their hands they fatigue when they start to write you're going to see a lot of hand switching because their hands get tired okay and then also so it affects also um spelling as well too then you're going to see more slouching in their desk or the computer or their heads way forward okay and, and then you're just going to see difficulty with processing ideas um, difficulty writing ideas onto paper for the computer, just coming up with the ideas to generating ideas and then to actually put them on paper or, or put them into onto to the computer. And you're also going to see difficulty with verbal expression of ideas or thoughts. And, and that, again, that goes back to when a child's having a hard time with something, they have a hard time understanding that they're having a hard time. They have a so they have a hard time to say, hey, I'm, I'm needing some help here. Um, this is really challenging for me and I need some help. So even that's going to be difficult for them to express. So they might sit there, you know, for a long time and not even start their school assignment because they don't even know how to process like, hey, I need help with this. Can somebody help me with this? All right. Okay, so it's also going to affect the child um, when they use their like, scissors or even you know, they're trying to glue because again, we're rock, the hand's not doing what it needs to do. Or even like when they're holding their eating utensils. Okay, so then you're going to see they prefer to eat with their fingers because it's, it's just easier than using a fork or spoon or like using a knife to spread the toppings with. All right, so let's see here. Also, you'll see difficulty tying shoes as well, too. Um, here's another reflex. It's called tonic labyrinthine reflex. Again, don't worry about the name of it. Let's just look at like the list of things it affects. So um, they didn't crawl as an infant, or they maybe didn't crawl for very long. Um, like I, I see, I see it. Um, if I see older kids and you know they're kids that walk. But if I ask them to, if they were to do an activity where they're crawling, they will have a hard time um, coordinating how to crawl. And um, their head will be looking down, like they have a hard time keeping their head up. But when you go back to when a baby crawls, they're gonna have to have their head up eventually so they know where they're going. But with older children, when this reflex doesn't integrate, it's really clear um, to be seen when if their crawling's not coordinated and they have a hard hold time holding their head up to see where they're going or they might turn their head to the side. Okay, so that's going to affect them sitting upright too. And you're going to see more slouched posture and a forward head or it's to the side more. 
Okay, so let's see. And then you're going to see where they easily fatigue. They have, like, their muscles aren't, um, you see low muscle tone, so that, that really goes hand in hand where they're not able to sit up very tall for very long. Okay, they might lock their legs in standing because that helps them maintain their posture. So basically their knees are locked. Okay, and that, that right there takes a lot of extra energy when someone locks their knees. All right, let's see here. And here's just some other things you might have seen like toe walking, difficulty with stairs. Um, let's see here. Where they avoid, they might avoid sport, uh, sports. They tend to cross their eyes more, which is going to affect their learning, like for reading, reading items from the board. Um, it's going to be affect them as far as throwing and catching a ball, which would affect them playing sports as well too. So that's where they might say, "I don't like, you know, like certain ball sports." All right, so, okay. Um, I wanna have time to answer questions here. So let me see if I can just kind of go through this a little bit faster here, because I've got quite a bit of information. Um, I think Kristen's gonna send out maybe a copy of this so you can see the checklist. So you can kind of go through the checklist. And again, I wouldn't worry about the name of the reflex, just to kind of look at like what areas that were, that your child's having, that you saw they had difficulty with in the past or they're still having difficulty with. Um, because again, that affects their development or for what they need to be doing at certain stages in their life. And, um, it might be that you're wondering, you know, can we still work with these reflexes? Well, yes. Um, and you kind of go back and work with like the brain has, is, is able to change. Okay, and there's lots of great science on that topic. And so we can go back, like I can go back and work with a child as far as with their developmental skills, which will help to integrate these reflexes, which will then help them with all their areas that they need to work on afterwards that they have a hard time with. Okay, so the symmetrical tonic reflex. So here you're going to see more hyperactivity or fidgety. Um, you're going to see where the ADHD behaviors come out or the ADD behaviors come out. Okay. So let's see here. Difficulty concentrating. You're going to see more a child who might have issues with impulse control. Um, shifting attention from one area to another area. Um, initiating task, like remembering items, being able to plan and organize, um, maybe difficulty with time management. Okay, so let's see here. Oh, okay, here's this is the end of the slides here. All right, so this was just about me here. And Okay, let me see if I can go down where questions would be. I'm gonna click out of this one area, see if I can uh, see any questions here. There are not any questions. Okay, okay. <laughs> I, I heard a lot of information with you all, so, um, but really just, I would look at this as a checklist of, and not worry about what the name of the reflex is because it's, it's you don't wanna get into that area. It's you just want to know like what your child had what your child has difficulty with. I think there's there might be uh, something here in the chat here. Okay, all right. Okay, no. I would say that if um, you know somebody notices all of these things, just a brief overview. Obviously, you can't go into detail with everything, but what kinds of things would an occupational therapist do for some of these re reflexes? Okay, so like what I would do is I would go back and work on um, like if I know that that area of the reflex was not integrated, and I can see it either you know visually through the child's behavior, where I can also, parents with the parent report of certain symptoms 
then I can go back and work on areas of those of child development and um, that would help those areas integrate. So um, like for example, a child who, like if we look, go back at babies, um, um, they, when they play on their stomach, they are building up so many core muscles with their, with their back extension muscles and their head. So like if they're on their stomach, like their head kind of bobbles around a little bit, but eventually they can hold their head up and they can push up on their arms and they can move their body from side to side. Okay. To find that toy they're looking for, or, you know, if they hear their parent parents voice, they will turn and navigate toward the parent or something. So I can go back and work with a child and, and I use like book, use all these activities through play, like they might be playing a game. And so they don't really know, you know, what they're working on. They just know they're having fun. And I can go back and um, work on these areas of child development um, in a way that's, you know, the child feels that they're being like um, respected. So they don't feel like they're doing something babyish. Okay. Because, um, and then, so that's like one thing I can work with them on. Um, and I can also work with them with um, just their coordination with using like one side of the body with the other side of the body and work a lot with them crossing midline. And that means that they can cross over midline without having to say, oh, I can use this hand for this area on this right side and use my left hand for things on the left side. All right, so when lower these areas of reflexes are are like um, we go back, I basically take the child back through these stages of child development, but they just think they're playing games while they're doing this and they're just having fun. So to help integrate those areas so that that way you start seeing changes going forward with it. There have been a couple questions asked. One was asked just to me, but it was at what ages do you treat this? And that kind of ties along with um, someone else who asked um, how long it would typically take to reintegrate the reflexes. And then there's a third question, but I can get back to that in a minute. Okay. Okay. Great question. So I can still work with these like at any age. Okay. Um, and just as an occupational therapist, just as a side note, um, we even work with primitive reflexes, like with adults, when adults have like, um, like a stroke. So any age you can work with primitive reflexes with. And, um, and so the younger, the better, of course. And the younger, the, the younger the child is and the quicker, the quicker results you get. Okay. Cause they're still in the younger age. When I say younger age, they could be like um, you know, anywhere from like preschool age to um, like second grade. So um, when they get a little bit older, it's you can still integrate them. It kind of depends on each child's system. I've seen kids where I maybe work with them for like about a year and things start clicking in easier. Now does it fix everything right away? No, because there's been so much stuff that areas of development that's not quite gone the way it should have. So you're still going back and working with a lot of different areas. Like you might get one area to where it's working better, but then you have to work on the next area. So it's kind of, you have to work with, it's a progression. So it still takes a little while. Um, I wish there was that, you know, it was magic and it worked quickly. But like with anything, it's it does work, but it does take time. And one of the other questions was with primitive reflex integrated and more able to access higher thinking centers, would that eliminate ADHD symptoms? I don't know if it will fully inter it depends like the child's age. I don't know if it would fully just make it go away. Um, but I do think that it will help 
decrease like the the symptoms that of ADHD. I have worked with kids who, while I'm working with this, like working on their developmental areas to go back and sort of like clean them up with the child. I have seen those kids be able to be more calm and to not or to have more, um, they have more access to and more control with their attention and their focus so that they can then access higher brain centers for listening to information better, taking it in, knowing how to respond to it without reacting. So I have seen improvements with kids um, in those areas. Um, definitely like all the kids I work with that I work, I take them through the these developmental steps. I do see differences with them all. The parents will see differences with them as well. That's awesome. Oh, there's another question. Okay. Um, when there is disintegration, how long does it take typically to reintegrate? And then um, do you know if this is similar to the Brain Balance Center? Actually, I think she asked two questions and one was earlier. So, sorry. Okay. Is okay. this similar to the Brain Balance Center approach? Um, I have heard of, um, of how the Brain Balance Center works. Um, I don't know if this is exactly how they work. Um, because like typically brain balance centers, they are not typically occupational therapists working with a, a person. Um, typically they're not. So, um, I think that I have heard the brain balance center, they have talked about the primitive reflexes. I just don't know if they're using the same approach or not. So what I've seen too, is if you take a child through these, like, more like exercises, the children, they do not like them. They're bored with them, it's not fun. But if I take them through more of a developmental approach where we're actually working on these reflexes, I see better progress, I see quicker results. And I see the child um, um, being able to cooperate and tolerate that session better. And if they're gonna tolerate it better, they're going to, um go through those steps a little bit better so it does you know each child's different for how, how long it takes for them to go through these steps um, kids that i work with who i see them more frequently i see them make quicker progress and um let's see here but as far as the brain balance center um i know that one's very costly i, I think that they're like you can, a parent can roll out like $14,000 with the brain balance center. I mean, you'd have to call to ask them on that exactly, but I think it's somewhere around there. Um, does insurance typically cover what you do? Yes, yes, medical insurance does cover what I do as an occupational therapist, yes. Mm -hmm. And I do not think that's the same for brain balance, just for parents who cost is important. Right, brain balance is, yeah, you're, it's out of pocket for everything. And I think you're looking at like 13 or $14,000 to do that. Safe for college. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, does anyone else have any other questions? I haven't seen anything else pop through. Yeah. I don't think so. Well, thank you for your time and um, coming back. And um, I guess one more question that came up when you were talking, is this something that families would do at home as well? Like, do you give them things to work on so that in between your visits, or is this something that you go for your visits and you're done? It could be either way. So if there's a parent, you know, if parents are able to, you know, if they are wanting to have some home program, then, the child can work on this at the therapy session and also work on some areas in between. So I typically like to tell parents to do certain things with their children because um, the child doesn't necessarily want to go through these exercises. I've seen um, other 
places go through certain just like exercises with the child and the child uh, even older kids they don't really like those extra like the like they're just exercise and they're not as fun but um again i take them through more of a developmental approach that we can um work with these primitive reflexes because that's how a child like a baby um, when they grow they're going through these areas of child development and they're actually going through these stages of primitive reflexes before they integrate and allow the next level to happen Very good. There was one more question. Do you need a referral from your pediatrician? It depends on the insurance company. So for example, Blue Cross and Blue Shield um, does not require a um, prescription from the doctor. You have to just check with each individual insurance company. I think there was, was there another question there? There was one more about a copy of the presentation. And yes, I will be um, post posting this to our website. Um, it usually takes a couple hours for the video to download, but then I can get that up and the slides. Um, I actually think, did you send me just the, um, I can make a handout basically from the slides. Oh, okay. So yeah, I, I was going to shorten the slides down and take off some of the uh, um, um, of the check parts of the checklist, but I just thought they were just every child is different and every child has different um, areas of the checklist that pop up. And um, you know, you can definitely reach out and email me um, if you and I can answer any other questions that you have after this right here, but. Um, I didn't want to take the approach of just giving you part of the checklist and then telling you to email me afterwards for the rest of the checklist because I see that quite often and I don't know about other parents or other people, but um, it, it's kind of a way people collecting other people's emails and I think it's a little annoying. So I, did, I don't like to come off like that. So, but definitely you can email me, email me with other questions um, that you have and, and I will be definitely, um, I will answer them the best I can. All right, well, thank you very much. Anything else, anybody else? I don't see any, and there were lots of thank yous. I don't know if you can see your chat now, okay. but. Oh, you're very welcome. All right, well, thank you everyone. And um, I will get this posted hopefully tomorrow morning, maybe not. We'll see how busy I am tomorrow, but okay. on the weekend for sure. All right, thank, thank you, Kristen. And thank you everybody who um, came to listen and I hope this was very helpful. Was. All, right. All right. Take care everybody and stay safe. Thank you. Bye. Bye.